um, thanks for coming. Um, I just ran into my uncle over there, Haskell, and my aunt, Drita, and my cousin Mark. Um, and uh, I guess I explain a little bit about why I'm here or my sort of evolution. Um, I grew up in Chicago in the 42nd story of a building and right in the heart of the city in downtown Chicago. And um, I always felt like an alien. Um, nothing really made sense to me. I was like, what is this world? What is going on here? It doesn't make sense. And um, my, my, uh, uh, I would get in trouble all the time um, when I went to uh, church. I went to Sunday school as a kid. And um, I took all of the tenets that I was taught in church very much to heart. And um, but you know that uh, led me to getting into trouble with my Sunday school teachers because I would say, you know, well, why don't you just get into the school? Oh, you can't say that. <laughs> and then I would uh, ask questions about what Jesus was like as a teenager because I always thought things about him when he was a baby and then when he was a man, or you know, what about when he was a kid? They'd be like, that showed that I didn't have faith because I was asking too many questions. They said I spent too much time staring at the fish tank and out the window. And so basically they, they booted me from, from Sunday school and I didn't get to graduate and I didn't get to pass my catechism and all this stuff. Um, and, and, and that just sort of was part of the course for pretty much the rest of my young childhood and, and early adult life. But um, my, my dad, uh, Haskell's brother who raised me, Jerry, uh, did an incredibly smart thing at, at the age of seven. He sent me to the camp that Haskell uh, and Jerry went to out in Colorado. So every year from the time I was seven to about 17 for two months, I went to a camp in the woods in Colorado where you live in covered wagons, no electricity, and you horse pack and you backpack and you build your fires and pitch your tents and scoop the poop and you know, all of everything. I mean, it's, and all of a sudden everything made sense to me. When I went to camp, I was like, oh, I can do this. I can, I can communicate with the horses just fine, uh, much easier than I can with other people. I have no problem, uh, you know, learning how to build a one match fire, pitch a tent, and all that. That kind of stuff really, it, it made sense, and I kind of found a little bit of my place in the world when I was in that natural environment and in that kind of um, place. Um, and then um, I think it was also later that year, the first year that I went to camp, that. Um, Used to, my parents used to drive to Wisconsin um, to go uh, away for the weekend. There was this overpass on the freeway that uh, they used to stop at and eat at this cafeteria, and I just hated the food. It was always like, you know, cream corn on the bread or, you know, like mystery meat and that kind of stuff. So I would always ask not to go in or, uh, you know, kind of put my voice for somewhere else, but it never won. And so, um, so I would ask my parents if I could stay in the car and um, wait until they were finished with dinner. And in those days, the, this is the movement days, um, you know, there was, wasn't as dangerous for kids to stay in the car as it is now. You know, you get to jail if you did that. But in those days, it was relatively safe. So, um, so I was in the car and, and I got bored after a little while sitting in the car. And so I, was, I, got, I got out of the car and was walking around. Yeah. The parking lot, and um, um, I saw this truck with a bunch of baby cats in it, and one particular calf um, and I really bonded, and we were you know, just kissing each other in love, you know, googly eyes for hours. And then the, the truck driver comes up, and I'm like, Excuse me, sir, what is this cat's name? He's like, Feel tomorrow morning at 7. And that's when I learned that I had had the ability to, to, to disassociate before. I, mean, I didn't know that. I didn't know. It didn't. It, it didn't really occur to me before what I was eating. You know what it was. What it was. At. From that point on, I, I did make a conscious decision, a rational decision, a, a mental decision. A, Political decision, ethical decision. I just literally could no longer disassociate the food on my plate from the creature that hit me. Anytime I saw food on my plate, I saw the creature, <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't force myself to gnaw on the flesh of another creature. I just couldn't do it. So I became vegetarian at seven, and um, and and even like years later, um, I was doing a, a, a splash, a film where I had to eat a lobster in the, in the 
seen it, and uh, and that uh, and they you know they, they said Disney was making the, the film, and they said at the time that Disney art department had had some trouble making a, a realistic looking fake lobster. Um, and they brought me a flat cookie shaped like lobster. I'm like, come on, you're Disney. That's the best you can do. But they said it was. So they said, really, you know, can you just Please, you know, just bite it to the lobster. Well, we can give you a rocket, you can just bite it, spit it out, and it won't actually be eaten. And I'm like, yeah, actually, that makes sense. I'm going to do it, but I'll do it, you know, that makes sense. I'll take a bite, spit it into the bucket, and between shots, and I'm going to actually eat the lobster. I'll still be a vegetarian. And maybe eat with it, and my car, work with it. Yeah, there you go. Guys, it's great. to me and I go to pick it up and I expect it for some reason, maybe because I've never eaten lobster, I didn't know really what it was going to do, but I expect when I pick it up it's just going to lift like a potato chip or like a you know, cookie or something, but instead of when I lift it up, it's kind of you know, it was dead, but at the time, but it was, you know, it was still flexible enough, it hadn't gone for rigor mortis or something, so um, it kind of like wilted and I was like, oh, sort of stunned and shocked and I threw it back down on the door. I was like, oh, I dropped it. I kind of got that hysterical, uh, ego kind of like hysteria, and then I started getting hysterical crying, and then I got hysterical getting wanked, but I was crying, and then I got hysterically crying, and I was like, it was just like, wow, makeup everywhere, it was a disaster, cut, you know, we got a redo, like, the whole thing had to be redone, I had tears in my hair, everything was a mess. So, um, you know, we took a little break, had to redo my whole face and everything, and then I, I just realized that even though I had you know, decided, you know, I, I intellectually committed to and decided to to uh, to eat this lobster, emotionally I was still not the boss. <laughs> so you know, I uh, uh, so I, I said I realized that that was still something that, that I was not really in my control, you know. Um, and it just so happened that years later. Um, you know, I, I learned that it's not only, you know, it's not only a really great choice for me, but also it's a great choice for the environment, it's a great choice for the planet, it's a great choice for a really living thing. And that's sort of um, one of the things that I want to talk to you about today is how the, the choices and the decisions and things that we make have ramifications in every other area, you know, about beneficial ramifications. So uh, the bigger ramifications, which are the bigger, uh, Picture, uh, but they're also the frost in the cake. So anyway, um, so anyway, then then I moved out to California as a uh, young adult to go to college um, out here and work and stuff. And I guess it wasn't until shamefully um, my, my late twenties that I really realized that I was a sort of adult and, and actually kind of in charge of my own life. Like I could choose to not only have a belief system, but also try to live by my beliefs, and that was something I never really knew. Uh, I never, I mean, I, didn't, okay. I guess I knew, but I just didn't really put it together. It's sort of embarrassing, but that's what it is. Um, and Haskell, my uncle, um, you know, he had introduced me at a pretty young age to, you know, the dangers of nuclear power. He made many documentaries on different, you know, subjects. He's an incredible, you know, my hero, activist. And, and he introduced me to all these things, and I, I, you know, was had a very strong set of beliefs, but I didn't really know that I could actually try to live by them um, until then. So, so I guess that's what I decided to do. Um, contrary to the fact that I'm standing up here right now before you guys, and contrary to the fact that I'm an actress, I'm actually usually incredibly painfully awkwardly and ridiculously shy. Um, I've, you know, I, I've gotten in trouble for that for ages, you know, I, I didn't do press for most of my major films. Basically because I thought I'd fade, I had to go on TV or a talk show or something, I just was like, I'm not 
just can't do it. It wasn't that I didn't support my work or any of that stuff. I just was too shy. And and you know, there are some actors who are exhibitionists and extroverts, and there are some who like to watch who are kind of shy and let you like to to be to I guess immerse themselves inside of another character and, and aren't really like you know, so I figured that the most powerful action, the most potent thing that I could do was to try to try to get my, um, my life in her, my beliefs. And I still feel like that's pretty much one of the most, or the most potent first step that any of us can take. Um, and and, and it's, an, it's an evolving process. I'm um, still doing it. And it will, I will probably always do it, I hope, until I, uh, I die. My, um, Cousin Mark has a film here, I guess, that he's talking about called How to Live Forever. Uh, I don't really plan to live forever. Um, but <laughs> but, um, but I, I think that you know, we don't continue to grow. And if we don't continue to evolve, it obviously we start to die. And, um, and so I hope that it will always be evolving. It will always be an evolving process. But it really has been and continues to be an incredible education on how to try to get in on a path that is in harmonious with my belief system. Um, so the first thing I did was I, I moved into a TV <laughs> and, and I got off the grid. And I moved into a TV just because my the house that I was moving into was uh, salvaged. It was a barn that was being torn down to put up a post office. And the, the, the uh, uh, people who were there knocking it down said, if I could take it before the wrecking ball came, I could have it. So it was an old barn, old growth barn, big, beautiful place, and it was just a great, gorgeous condition. It's um, small in this room, probably about half the left of the left side of this room, but beautiful. And, um, and I, uh, while I was uh, while I was putting up the barn, I was, I was living in a TV. Um, great dwelling, highly recommended, um, maybe not all year round, but um, you know, depends on um, where it is. Housing at Hardy Bar. Um, I came back one day and I'd been away for a couple of days and then the snow and I came back one day and I couldn't find my TV and I was wandering around in the snow. And, and I noticed that I put out these bushes and I realized out of the treetops because it had snowed so much that they looked like shrubs. And then I found my TV and it was only this tall. And I just had to dig and dig. It took me two days to dig it out. But the great thing about TVs is that it just like, it was smashed like this. I didn't have much furniture in there, but a bed, a rocking chair, a desk, um, a fire pit in the center, um, some cushions and for the stuff over on the side for a couch, a little kitchen area, but mostly everything low, and some firewood and stuff. And uh, all of the, the desk and the chair and the, the few things that I had had, when I guess when it snowed, got slowly pushed into the center of the fire pit. So there wasn't one thing broken, um, even though the tent TV was basically shaped like this instead of you know like this. And um, after I dug it out, um, it had this uh, snow uh, corridor all the way around it, a little bit over my head. Um, and uh, the sun, once the sun got onto it, the TV just went whoa, 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 and popped right back into shape. And I still have the TV to this day. But um, so it, I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful dwelling, and I I am in love with my TVs. But um, it was definitely a little harsh in the winter. Um, but anyway, so the first thing I did with my house is that I, I I burned it into the hillside. I situated it facing southwest, so it gets both passive and active solar. I got a solar array. Um, that's tracking. I did a gray water system um, and a water capture system on the roof. Um, um, I unfortunately hadn't taken a permaculture course at that time, so I didn't learn about the types of refrigerators that you can build that just use the cooling uh, vents that you can put you know, through over a house so you don't ever need to have an electric refrigerator, which is a shame. I wish I had done that. I went recently to Australia where I took a, a couple month permaculture course and um, uh, that I saw, uh, it was David Holbrook's house, I think, but he had this amazing refrigerator. It's like a wall and it's just drawers and everything's all year round perfectly, perfect temperature to keep everything cool. He, he 
had a tiny little mini bar for fridge that he, put, that he used uh, electrically, but he never had to use that. It was always empty. Um, um, but anyway, um, so uh, uh, let's see. What else do we have? We don't have. We had. We have. We don't have incinerated toilets. We do have one composting toilet. Um, I do really love the incinerating toilets now. I think in the future, um, that's sort of what I'm looking towards. Um, definitely waterless toilets. Um, and uh, um, I've, it, radiant heat on the floors, um, greenhouse uh, the one side of the house in, um, so that you know we can grow wild plants and vegetables and herbs and things inside the house, um, as well as it just keeps the air humidified and fresh and everything. Um, and uh, uh, we channel the little um, spring through the uh, through the front of the greenhouse window, so there's a uh, sort of humidifier, a natural humidifier. <laughs> As the sun hits the spring, the little creek, the little bit goes more the inside of the window, so it sort of humidifies the house and makes a lovely sound. And um, let me see what else. Um, oh, yeah, Import, most importantly, I guess, I, I, I also uh, keep the petroleum habit, which is a good thing to do, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. But so, um, so anyway, that's sort of, that's sort of my evolution, you know, in, in terms of like how I just tried to, to, to live. Um, there was also the other thing about the house was we tried to reuse everything that we took out of the ground when we burned the house. And so all of the stone that came out of the earth we reused in, um, in the fireplaces and, and all the stone that was on the ground that was covered with moth and made into a beautiful couch that I have to take pictures of every once in a while in the water. Um, because it's still living moss, you know, and lichen and stuff, and it's gorgeous. It's like the most beautiful painting you can imagine. Um, so, um, so anyway, um, that's sort of um, how I came to the, that place, and and I guess I I, I, I uh, at some point I just realized, you know, well, where where are we? You know, where are we now? You know, we're 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 in this uh, uh, world. Where um, you know it, it's just a mess. I mean, uh, as you guys um, know, you know we're we're in the midst of you know overpopulation and and you know there's slavery and there's mass extinctions and there's uh, you know ocean acidification and climate crisis and all of this mess. And I'm not necessarily particularly a rabid optimist like some of the people that I know. You know, <laughs> I, I I I I get heartbroken these things and I get scared and worried but I know that that's not uh, effective in terms of, of taking a, an attitude towards how to affect positive change so so uh, I remind myself constantly of the solutions that are actually available to us and that's really what it what happened um, and spurred me into another level which is really why I'm actually standing here before you today because um, uh, I think it was really 9-11 that changed things for me and made me uh, become more of a vocal activist. Because right after 9-11, I realized that our country was going to war for oil. And, uh, and, and I hadn't been using petroleum fuel for years. Uh, so I was like, OK, people need to know. People just need to know that this is possible. Um, and so, um, and so on uh, the first anniversary of 9-11, I um, went on every Fox News pundit conservative show that I did, and every other show that would have me, and you know I did all the rounds of all the news stations and everything, and I and I said you know this is, this is not it's absolutely unnecessary that we, we we're so dependent on uh, the fossil fuels in this country, and and um, I uh, my caretaker of my house who was who was this, one of my best friends still to this day uh, was this, this incredibly charismatic charming. Uh, a uh, guy who told me uh, first about um, the options that were available to me. He introduced me to the story of Rudolf Diesel, who, um, when uh, it was an inventor in, in 1900 at the World's Fair, he unveiled what was his greatest invention with two words in the machine. He's like, ladies and gentlemen, peanut oil. And he invented the diesel engine to run on peanut oil so the farmers could grow their own fuel. And then a few years later, he was found floating in the English Channel and they had taken his engine and modified it to run on this toxic byproduct of petroleum, which is what we call diesel fuel. It had nothing to do with Andy Wilbur's grave, you know, they called the fuel after his name. Um, 
But, uh, but the good news is any diesel engine can still run on vegetable oil, whether it's new, used, recycled, uh, you know, hemp, corn, soy, flax, you know, canola, whatever. Um, obviously there are ethical and unethical sources of oil the same way that there are ethical and unethical sources of everything, food, etc. Um, so I, uh, I, I started basically, you know, trying to sound the alarm about uh, about alternative fuels, because one of the other things that Charis and my friend taught me was that similarly around the same time, um, uh, the first Ford was made. And the first Ford, the majority of the materials in the first Ford that made the car itself was hemp. And, uh, the, f and the first Ford was ran on alcohol fuel, um, it was also made from hemp. And, um, you know, when when you think about prohibition, I mean, basically, Johnny Appleseed, who was you know, going around, going up the rivers and going into the country, was distributing seeds for apples. He wasn't just distributing apples so that everyone could eat it at Great Apple and plant apple orchards and you know sell apple apple butter and you know applesauce to their friends. It was he was selling apple seeds that were considered spitters. They were seeds for apples. Most of the majority of the varieties of apples were not even edible. They were tasted so bad that people were making uh, alcohol out of it. But they weren't making alcohol so that they could all drink 3,000 gallons of alcohol every day. They were drinking some of it for sure, but they were making it because they were too far off the shore to use whale oil um, for, to light their lanterns and to use this as fuel. And so alcohol became a replacement fuel um, for whale oil, which was had been previously used, and and uh, the first car was made to run on alcohol fuel, and the same thing about uh, uh, any gas burning car, any petroleum burning car, whether it's a Prius or a Honda or a, you know whatever, any any old car that runs on gas that's fuel injected. So that means probably not the ones before you know seventies, but a fuel injected car can run on 100% alcohol with a tiny little modification. It's a little box that's about the size of a cigarette box twice, like that same thickness and about that size. Any mechanic can put it in under five minutes, you don't need any special skills. You put this little box in your car and it can run on 100% alcohol, it burns clean, it can be made from waste materials uh, and an infinite number of renewable resources. Anything that's starchy material, anything that's sugar based. Um, so I learned that, there's a, there's a guy named David Bloom wrote a book called Alcohol Can Be a Gas. Um, and I, he's a brilliant guy, the book's about this big, so you really have to be very interested to read it all. Um, it's like a telephone book, and dense, packed really thickly with information. Um, but anyway, so, so that's sort of how my activism began, is just to try to share information, essentially, not to tell people what they should do, but at least let people know that, that, we, that we don't need to be a slave to the system of of, you know, when we think about petroleum, murder, mayhem, literally murder, mayhem. I've been to Nigeria, I've seen places around the world and that, you know, people, uh, entire villages and communities have been decimated and destroyed by cancer, by things, and by, by, by uh, the oil companies that I, you know, have, have to admit that I've even filled up my gas tank up many times from their, uh, their stations that have left behind just disastrous circumstances all over the Amazon because they figured, oh, we're in the middle of the jungle, no one will ever see, even though there's international standards on how we have to drill, what we have to do to clean up after ourselves, no one's going to go down here, let's just leave a line pit and leave a mess for everybody, and it poisons the rivers, and poisons the, the land, and, and, and entire villages have died out. So, um, so I just wanted to try as much as possible to take myself out of that, um, out of that game. Of course, you know, petroleum is in everything. It's in your lipstick, it's in your uh, candles, it's in uh, your personal lube, it's, in e it's literally in everything. It's just like, oh my god. So it's really, you know, once again, an evolving process, an educational process on how to kind of get out of that, uh, out of that uh, um, uh, system. And so then I started a, 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 a website, um, which I call DH, my, my initials, uh, I only threw them on there just because I want, I call the website TH Love Life, and I want to call the website Love, Love Life because that's really what it's all about for me. If you love life, then you want to protect it. You know, you want to protect and take care of and nurture something you love. And if you 
about five men. Like, I mean, I, I love the trees, I love the birds, I love the bugs, I love the creatures, I love the animals, and, I, and so, so I started this website, I threw my initials on it because the actual bugflife.com was owned by some radio station in Hawaii that wanted to sell it for a million dollars to a dating online situation, <laughs> <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, so, so my website was started just to try to share information, get information out there, uh, because when I started trying to get off the grid back in the day, it wasn't that easy. There was, it was really hard. I tried, went through a lot of solar refrigerators, it didn't work. I went through a lot of different kinds of things that just didn't work, or it was hard to find one of the best of the best that current, that current technology and, and information out there was. So I decided to start a website that would at least give my perspective on what was really functional and, uh, and, and, and great to get it out there. And also little you know, bits of inspiration too. So I made video blogs um, uh, almost every week on sustainable solutions and, and organizations of people who were inspiring me doing inspiring things. Then I got a phone call from my friend Julia Butterfly Hill, who I you know, worship and adore and idolize. She um, is an activist who obviously some of you know and love too, um, but she's a, a, the woman who, well, she was a young girl at the time who spent uh, over two years in a redwood tree to try to protect her from becoming a redwood dad, one of the tallest redwood trees, in, in, um, which is, is crazy that the, you know, the last remaining ancient grove of redwoods still aren't protected. We think they are, but they still aren't, even to this day. So, um, so anyway, Julia, um, inspired me so much when I first learned about her story and um, really moved me and um, I always used to say, wow, you know, wonder if God will be a day where I'll find my butterfly moment because I think what she did really drew so so much attention to, um, to you know, the crisis that the Redwoods were facing but also it was really inspiring because it was unbelievable, her commitment and her clarity and it was so. It was a very simple gesture, but also very complex, obviously, and and, and it was um, it was just uh, just phenomenal. And so I was very inspired by it. And anyway, she called me up and she said, "Oh, listen, I'm trying to help out these people who have who have this amazing project in South Central LA. Will you come down with your camera?" And I'm like, "Great, I'll go make a video blog, and and I will help her. I'll help Julia, my hero, to spread some, spread the word." And I go down to South Central LA. Um, it was about four years ago, and and you know it's South Central LA. It's right where Rodney King got beat up. I mean, it was it's right there. It's the Alameda corridor, um, right off the ten, and um, you know one of the most heavily trafficked areas of the city. Uh, you know, there's a truck corridor right there. There's a train that goes right by. There's uh, a freeway, obviously, right there. And uh, it's just an area that's surrounded by warehouses and, and, and has a reputation for, for being quite dangerous. And um, I get down there, and there's this 14-acre farm. I mean, gorgeous farm with 500 mature fruit trees, um, fields of corn, and avocados, and mangoes, and cabbage, and traditional medicinal plants and herbs, and you know, all the, the majority of the people in the community who were farming it, there were 350 farmers that had plots in the, in the farm, and they had fed their entire families, which were rather large, and, um, and then also on Sundays they had a farmer's market for the whole community. But the farmer's market was like the best farmer's market I've ever been to because they had people playing music, they had people cooking, so you could also you could have the food that was prepared in traditional ways. And when you wanted some corn or something, you'd go into the plot and pick it yourself. And then, you know, say, I want these corn, here's the corn. So you'd also learn something about how things grow and when they're mature and ready for harvesting and stuff. And it was just so beautiful. It was so amazing. And it was one of the only places in that whole region that uh, uh, was a safe haven for kids to play. Because even the, the park, which was far, pretty far away, but there's a park down in that area, kids get shot almost on a regular basis. And you know, there's all the crack deals and stuff like that going down. So, um, so it was a safe haven for kids. It brought in all kinds of biodiversity. There was, you know, bees and lizards and you know, all kinds of uh, habitat for birds and, and everything. And, 
and was bioremediated, sucking in that carbon that was coming out of those trucks and all the, the traffic in that corridor. It was just like the most beautiful green, just you know, happy, thriving thing you've ever seen. And uh, I was just, you know, stunned. I, mean, I was just so moved by the beauty of this place and the unexpected, you know, this unexpected jewel. You know, it's like one of those things where you, you know you're walking down some dirty street and then there's this gorgeous flower popping through the concrete. It was like that on steroids. You know, it was just like, oh my God, this is heaven. And um, that I just decided that I would do whatever I could to help um, help this this uh, farm stay. It was the largest urban farm in the U.S. at the time. And um, they had, um, it was literally right across the street from the food bank. Um, and it had started because after the riots, the um, uh, city gave it to the community as a peace offering. It was just a big cement dump. There were a bunch of you know, broken refrigerators and even body parts were found out there. It was just a dump. It was just a big refuse piece of foul land. And the city had given it to the community as sort of a peace offering after the riots. And so they, the community dug out the cement, cleaned it up, put it, brought in soil, planted it, and had 14 years grown this, this, uh, this garden of Eden. And, um, and uh, it, at this point in time, there was an under the table deal made by the city to, um, to turn the, the land back into a warehouse, to sell it back to the developer and, um, and uh, turn it into a warehouse. And they sold it for a ridiculously low price that it had been uh, uh, because it was an under the, t under the table deal. So this is a, a community, a group of farmers who had not, not very much, you know, in terms of economic resources. To uh, to fight you know fight the man with but they bonded together and they found a, a, an incredible lawyer who worked pro bono who said that he would represent them and sure enough they went there's a great film about this whole legal struggle called the Garden it's nominated for Academy Award the year before last and you can get it online I highly recommend watching it very quickly um, but they you know went to court and fought and and you know judge every judge was you know said. This is this was a total illegal sale. It threw it out of court, you know. It threw it and said, you, you guys keep your, you know, keep this land. It was it was public property. It's an illegal sale. You can keep it. Kept getting overturned. Um, three times they won, and three times it was, you know, it was, over, it was the, you know, the corruption. You guys know how that works. So, um, so anyway, at this point they were facing eviction. They needed to raise fourteen point three million dollars to buy it back from the developer because even though he had just gotten it. From City at five million, he said, "I'll sell it. It'll be fourteen point three. So, um, you know, an almost unimaginable amount for this community to try to raise. And um, so that's sort of what I was doing down there was trying to raise, the, you know, help raise awareness and raise money to to uh, to help buy the farm. And um, over the three and a half weeks that I was there, I ended up living on the farm. I never left from that very first minute that I got down there with my camera. I didn't even get to go home and get a toothbrush. But thankfully, people came to visit me and bring me, brought me toothbrushes and things. Um, but I stayed on the farm, slept down there and everything. I wasn't much sleeping um, for, for three and a half weeks. And uh, we, we managed to end up raising the $16.3 million. Um, and then the developer said, he wouldn't sell for a million, hundred million dollars to those people because they were all illegal aliens in his mind because they were mostly Hispanic. Um, and so he bulldozed the farm. Um, this is four years ago. It's still sitting there in a dirt lot because no one would develop it. He, he had a deal with Forever 21. And they had obviously some sweatshop issues and stuff and I don't think they wanted more of a bad karma uh, reputation thing. So it didn't get developed into a warehouse. And now, guess what? It's back up for sale. And now he's willing to sell it to those people. Um, <laughs> so anyway, the fight is back on for the South Central Farm. But that led me into, I guess, uh, that's how I ended up in county, uh, <laughs> in solitary. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I think they thought I was a ringleader or something, which I definitely wasn't. But, <laughs> but um, but anyway, that's sort of what what ended up spurring me into action, and and that's I guess what I'd like to speak to you guys mostly about um, is is action and the need for it, because as, as I said before, we are in a state of 
enormous crisis, but we have solutions to address every single one of those crises, whether they be slavery. Yes, there is a recipe to end slavery in our time. It's a book by Kevin Bales, highly recommended, and slavery it outlines exactly what needs to be done to end slavery in our lifetime. Um, ocean acidification, uh, uh, the you know energy crisis, all these different issues, we have solutions to be able to solve these already. Yes, they can be made more affordable, more available, and more accessible, but we already have them and we have the power to begin. So the most important thing, I think, aside from trying to get your own life in harmony with your belief system is to speak out. And today is an incredible day of action. Right now, as we're sitting here, tens of thousands of people are downtown um, you know, supporting workers' rights. It's incredibly inspiring. There are people in front of the federal building right now um, that are demanding our right to know about GMOs um, so that we have accessibility to the labeling of GMOs in our products. Um, and you know, the, I think that, that the uh, joining together of our voices, the insisting on a, to, you know, our ability to live in a vibrant, compassionate, uh, um, healthy, and sane world um, is, is crucial. And the thing that I've learned over the years, uh, more than anything, is that people generally uh, you know, are, are make wise decisions if they're informed. So share information. and. Get out there and show up because very few people actually do come down and show up. And that's it's absolutely crucial that if we do really want to see a world that, that doesn't have the insanity, that we actually start speaking out. You know, fight against the, the Citizens United against the FEC. If you're interested, to check out Annie Leonard's video. That's the thing that gives the uh, giant corporations the the right uh, personhood. And makes it, you know, it gives them an unlimited amount of funds to back politicians. So, uh, you know, all of these issues are important to that we share information, we share information about the solutions, and we share uh, uh, our, you know, our voices and uh, support each other. So, thank you so much. And um, I'm around most of the day if anyone wants to talk to me and ask me questions.